Can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, let's just run through some little housekeeping bits and bobs. Um, please keep your mic muted uh, for the entirety of this talk. Um, if you get server muted, just usually the mods will just server mute anyone who joins who doesn't mute immediately. Just let us know at the end so we can unserver mute you. Please ask your questions in the lectures and conferences channel. Um, it's in this same category. I'll be going through the questions at the end and reading them out to our wonderful speaker at the end. Um, so without further ado, we're so, so lucky to be joined by Tess. Tess has a PhD and she studied the microbiome and she's published several papers. So a real expert with us tonight <laughs> or this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are in the world. So Tess launched microbials during the pandemic, just like Biocord, and as a way to show the world all about microbes and to share a microbe moment where microbes changed your life for the better. And Microbiogals is a website with a blog, a podcast, a news outlet. There's even a microbe-themed recipe bit. Uh, I was taking a look at the mushroom coffee. I was very interested in that. <laughs> so if you're interested, I really, really highly recommend checking out microbiogals.com. Fantastic quality um, of resources and just amazing. So without further ado, let's all have a collective microbe moment and let Tess infuse us all with her love of the microbial world. So Tess, take it away whenever you're ready. You can share your slides and get going. Hello, can everybody hear me? Uh oh. Okay, so. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, you're. Perfectly. And my slides are sharing? Yep, I can see them now. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tess. I am the founder of Microbials, and today I'm here to talk to you about what's your microbe moment. Okay, so what's your microbe moment? So today I'm gonna to talk about a number of different things and I hope across some of these things you'll find something that relates to you. So first I'll talk a little bit about what is microbials and then how microbes affect you. And we'll go into topics such as how microbes affect the environment and top ways microbes affect botany and agriculture, which is what I have my PhD in, as well as ways that microbes are impacting biomed and biotech of today. So first, uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about my blog that we have. So what is Microbi Gals? We are science stories and news for the microbial enthuse. We have some posts on history and scientist spotlights, predominantly with minorities and women and some of these people who get lost in history. Um, those are my favorite pieces to write, I think. We have a segment called uh, The Bomb, The Best of Microbiology News, where we talk about current events and the biggest, greatest things in microbiology. We talk about pathogens of humans and of plants, which I think plants in agriculture usually don't get quite as much um, publicity than the human counterparts. And then we have uh, fungal recipes and talk about fermentation. Um, so we have three members that are part of my Kroby Gals, and one of them is really into mead making. So we have a lot on home brewing and mead making as well. And then recently we launched this um, initiative called Society of Symbionts. So these are, this is our school of microbes who are trained to be symbionts to their hosts. And so it's from the perspective of microbes teaching microbes to go out into the world. And so these are sort of our, some of our characters that we have. We have uh, Becky Lafarge up at the top, so she's a bacteriophage. We have Chef Fermé Brewer, who is a yeast, um, who is involved in fermentation. We have our headmistress, Miss Ecoli, and she Psychrobacter, who teaches our history pieces. Then we have Timmy the Tardigrade, who talks about extremophiles and is the swimming coach of the school. And then we have Miss Michael Risey, who talks about nature and the environment. 
So as I said, we have three members of the Microbial team, and these are my favorite people in the whole wide world because um, one of them is my mom. So Julie is my mom, and she is really into hiking and cooking, and so she's looking at the microbial world through those lenses and does pieces about the wood wide web and how we can put make chaga tea was one of her recent ones. And then my fiance, Jonathan Mitchell, um, my partner in crime with Microbi Gals is the other member of Microbi Gals. And he has a master's degree in medical microbiology. And he's also an uber nerd, really into sci-fi. So we have a number of pieces kind of relating microbes with Star Wars um, or sci-fi in general. And like I said, he's getting into home brewing now as well. So it's been really fun to kind of work with people from, um, like my mom does not have a science degree at all, but she's really great to kind of bounce ideas off of. Um, yeah, so this is our team and a lot of what we have, I will present today comes from them as much as it does from me. So um, I've mentioned this a little bit. This is sort of what we do. We do stuff on history. We do stuff on current events. We do stuff on the food that you're eating. Um, we have some, we have, we actually made a virtual escape room, which is all about developing your own vaccine to escape um, a vampire. And then we've done stuff on how to make your own chaga tea recipes to even um, how to make microbial Christmas ornaments. Uh, and we're really open to ideas. So if you have any ideas, if you want to join in some sort of collaboration, just sort of reach out to us and we're really open to that. We also do some freelance writing. So if you have a project along those lines, feel free to reach out. So moving on, um, why do I love microbes? Uh, there's a number of reasons. I like fighting for the little guys, uh, the 99 percenters, the ones that don't get a lot of recognition from day to day. I believe microbes have a lot of really bad PR. We always talk of them as pathogens, and we always dismiss the fact that they are doing wonderful and fabulous things to us on a daily basis. They are everywhere and always present, but we often don't think of them or see them. And I think because of this, because there's so much diversity in the microbial world, and there's so much that we're not thinking about this, they really have a limitless potential right now to solve some of the issues that we, are, we have as a society. Oh, this keeps going backwards. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to start with top ways microbes affect you. And so in each one of these sections, I break it down into three smaller sections, three examples of how microbes affect whatever we're talking about. So first off, we will discuss my, the micro menu. So microbes are responsible for some of my favorite foods, and I'm sure there's some foods on here that you can relate to as well. So we have Saccharomyces cerevisiae, often known as baker's yeast is responsible for mead and wine and beer and cheese and bread. Um, so the saccharomyces, the yeast, are really, really important for a lot of these foods that we have on a daily basis. Uh, cheese and yogurt and kefir and a lot of dairy products could not be created without the help of streptococcus, lactobacillus, and leuconostic, and of course pseudomonas as well. So if you ever had a probiotic, lactobacillus is one of the things that are often in probiotics, but you can get them naturally from these fermented foods. And then there's chocolate and coffee, which I think are less talk about, less talked about and forgotten in the fermented foods. But you have to ferment the chocolate beans and the coffee beans in order to get the product that we love and enjoy. So these uh, could not be created without Erwinia, Leuconostic, and Saccharomyces, again, our yeast. So moving on to how microbes are our nutrient engineers. So microbes can do a lot of stuff, and we have about three pounds of microbes in our gut, trillions of microbes living there. And they're doing stuff like training the immune system, but they're also doing stuff like helping us synthesize nutrients. One of these nutrients is vitamin B. So there are eight different kinds of vitamin B, and we cannot synthesize them as mammals. We get them either from the food we eat or from our microbial friends. 
So for instance, thiamine, also known as vitamin B1. If you're deficient in this particular vitamin, you're lethargic. You can develop Barberry disease, which is a disease of the perfer peripheral nervous system. But we, they know that the gut microbiome can help you synthesize these vitamins, such as lactobacillus casei, bifidiobacterium bifidum, and prevotella copri. Vitamin B6 is another one that our microbial friends can synthesize, particularly Bacteroides fragilis, Bifidiobacterium longum, and Colonicella aerofasciens. If you're deficient in vitamin B6, you can develop rheumatoid arthritis and other neuronal, neuronal dysfunctions. And then final, my final example here is vitamin B12. So B12 is really important in your immune system. But lucky for us, Ruminococcus lactarius, Lactobacillus planetarium, and Bifidiobacterium infantis is able to synthesize this vitamin. And then finally in this section, I want to talk about how microbes are our body's defenders. They can protect us from incoming pathogens. And there are lots of examples of how microbes can impact and defend our bodies. But one of the, the best known ways is with Clostidium difficile. So C. diff, as it is more commonly called, causes diarrhea and damages the intestinal lining. It can cause inflammatory in your gut and can lead to death. It can be really hard to get rid of and very easy to spread. Oftentimes you see it in hospitals where one patient will have it and nurses or doctors will accidentally transfer it to the next patient in the next room and soon you have a whole wing of a hospital infected with C. diff. C. diff is really hard to get rid of with antibiotics and oftentimes there is little hope for these patients once antibiotics doesn't work. So they discovered that actually what is something that can be successful is fecal transplants, which is exactly how it sounds. It's transferring a healthy fecal sample into someone who has C. diff. And what happens is those microbes in that healthy fecal sample will be able to colonize the gut and then diminish the population of C. diff, which then lowers the toxins that are produced and establishes a better healthy microbiome, allowing, not allowing C. diff to take over. And they have found that this has an up to 85% success rate, which is huge. So that is some ways that the microbes affect you every day. Now I wanna talk about how microbes affect the environment. And we're gonna talk, our first story is about climate changing. So, there is uh, a number of marine microbes that are able to photosynthesize. So they're able to create oxygen. And they do this, and so one of them is Prochlorococcus. And it's responsible for 5% of the global photosynthesis, which is a huge percentage for something so small. But it can only do this with the help of its best friend, who is Ultramonas. So Ultramonas can produce this enzyme, which I have rep represented here with a box of popcorn. And so Ultramonas will create this enzyme and share it with Prochlorococcus under normal conditions. However, what they're starting to see is as we're increasing our carbon dioxide levels in the earth, we're actually acidifying our oceans or lowering the pH of our oceans. And in turn, this is increasing the temperature of the oceans as well. Now, this can stress microbes out. It may not seem that different to you or I when we have a 1% difference in temperature a year or one degree difference in temperature a year. However, to the microbial world, one degree difference can be the difference between life and death. And that is what we see with this harmony between Ultramonas and Prochlorococcus. So when we have these conditions, when we're changing the pH of the oceans, Ultramonas is, all, is not sharing this enzyme anymore. And this enzyme is the difference of life and death to Prochlorococcus. If it doesn't get this enzyme, which it cannot create on its own, it dies in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. So what we need to do is have more Prochlorococcus in the world. Um, but what we're doing is diminishing Prochlorococcus. But are, these microbes have a potential to shift some of the issues we're seeing in climate change, as long as we're protecting them. The next example I have is about methane digesters. So methane digesters are kind of these giant tin cans, right? They're very, very ugly. They kind of look like 
water towers, but even bigger and smellier. And what you end up doing is you put a bunch of organic waste into these big containers and you close it off and it creates an anaerobic environment or an environment without oxygen. And what happens is the microbes in there then can eat all this organic waste and produce two products that are essential for us or helpful to us in the very least. One is it can create bioenergy that we can use for electricity. It also can create a digestive digestate, which we can then use into fertilizers and put back into the land to help grow our plants. So Project um, Drawdown, which is a big project on sustainability, estimates that if we have enough anaerobic digesters, we can avoid 6.2 to 9.8 gigatons of greenhouse gases. Now, I didn't know what a gigaton was when I first read this fact. It just seemed like a huge number. So I, I dug a little deeper and I said, okay, well, what is a gigaton? A gigaton is equivalent to a hundred million African elephants. And we're talking 6.2 to 9.8 times this in greenhouse gas mass. So this could be huge. Now, methane digesters are um, terribly stinky. They're not very pretty, but they can have a huge impact and it's all because of the microbes that we have in them. And then I wanna talk about a little bit about rain. Um, so if you just think about the last time that it rained, if you're like me, one of the things that comes up is the smell, the smell of rain. It's so pleasant, it's earthy. It has a great, I don't know, great memories for me when it rains outside. And this smell, if you enjoy it, is due to Streptomyces. So Streptomyces is a microbe that's found in soil across the world. And what it does is it can produce this metabolite, the smell called geosmin. And geosmin attracts springtails. And so that's the insects here in this picture. So the springtails will come. And similar to the way that trees rely on um, birds to eat their seeds and disp disperse their own populations across the globe, this is sort of what's happening here. The springtails come in and they eat the spores of Streptomyces and then can go deposit them in other locations. So what we have is the odor that we call petrichor. And it's all due from Streptomyces trying to spread its uh, population to a higher dispersion. And then we can talk about snow. So snow is actually can be created from a protein called INAZ. And this protein is created by Pseudomonas syringae. So what happens is Pseudomonas syringae can be in the middle of a, a little droplet of water. And it can produce this protein called INAZ, I-N-A-Z, which then creates ice nucleation and forms a snowflake that we all love. And then it's sort of like its own little parachute. It can gently glide its way down back to Earth when it finally snows. And this is kind of interesting because Pseudomonas syringae is a pathogen to, to tomato plants. And so this is a way that Pseudomonas is able to disperse itself to other locations. And so fields that may not have had a Pseudomonas syringae problem in the past have it in the spring if a Pseudomonas snowflake falls into the fields. And so next time you may catch a snowflake on your tongue, just think of the little Pseudomonas syringae that you may have caught as well. And now we move into microbes affecting biomed and biotech. And really, microbes have impacted biomed and biotech in more ways than anyone can fit into a single lecture or discussion. So I'm going to talk about three different ways and just highlight some of the impacts that microbes have played in our medical history. The first is one of my favorites. This story is crazy. This is the story of the discovery of penicillin, our first antibiotic. And we actually have a couple blog posts on our website about this crazy story. And we're gonna turn it into a podcast sooner or later. But the story that I'll tell today is just, when I started to research this topic, I was originally gonna do one blog post or whatever. And then it ended up being 15 pages of research. And so now it's, 
quite a lot of information. And I think that just sort of tells how interesting this story is. And quite frankly, I'm surprised this has not been turned into a movie, just because the characters are so out of the world and there's so many coincidences that occurred for us to get to penicillin. And one of the things that I think is kind of interesting with penicillin is that the allies were the ones that were able to mass produce and mechanize penicillin. And so the allied forces in World War II got to penicillin before the, their competitors. And so it may be that penicillin played a bigger role in winning the war than we give it credit. Since, it's in, since we discovered it in the 1940s is when we really started using it, it's estimated that 80 million to 200 million people have been saved by this drug. And as a final note, I just want to, it's a final side topic, I guess I will say, that Alexander Fleming, he was the Scottish scientist who discovered penicillin in 1928. He is regarded as the third greatest Scot of all time. For which I say, how come he's not the first? I mean, he saved 200 million people. If you're interested, number one is Robert Burns, and number two is William Wallace. I kind of think Alexander Fleming deserves to be the top dog on that list. But penicillin and other antibiotics do have an issue for us. Because of our overuse, we have caused multidrug-resistant bacteria to be on the rise. So you kind of have to think of this as an arms race. This is the microbial arms race. One microbe will produce an antibiotic against another microbe. And that microbe will then eventually learn to combat that, that um, antibiotic. And so you end up having kind of this arms race similar to the way that humans have an arms race. And what we're seeing is because we've kind of stripped the antibiotic from the biological mechanism and use it as a chemical, that these microbes are able to um, get resistance to this faster. And what this means is we're going to need new ways to combat our pathogens or our infectious diseases in the future. Soon, antibiotics like penicillin may not work as well as they did in the past. And so that brings me to phage therapy. So phage or bacteriophages are bacterial viruses. What they do is they infect bacteria. So they're infectious diseases for our infectious diseases. So multi-drug resistant bacteria, as I said, is a huge problem of today. It kills 700 million people per year. And the World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, multi-drug resistant bacteria will kill more people than cancer. And that is huge. That's going to be a huge problem in the next 30 years. And so we need to start developing new ways now so that we can save those people as, as we approach 2050. And so the thing with phage therapy is it can be very targeted. For instance, Becky Lafarge over here only likes certain pseudomonas strains. It doesn't like lactobacillus. It doesn't like um, any of the other gut microbes. It just likes pseudomonas syringae. And so she's going to go in and she's going to find just pseudomonas syringae and infect it. And after it's infected, it can burst this, it bursts the cells open and then that bacteria dies. And what this ends up meaning is that it's not affecting human cells. It's not affecting good microbes. It can be highly targeted um, to solve some of these issues of infectious diseases. But on the flip side, because it's so targeted, it can be really hard to find the right phage for the right diseases. And so that is a challenge right now that kind of prevents phage therapy from being in the forefront of our medical systems. But I do think it's something that we're going to hear more and more about as we move closer to 2050. And then my final topic here is cell factories. Predominantly, this is the work of E. coli and yeast. So these two microbes, E. coli and yeast, we know a lot about their genomes. They are one of the first genomes to ever be sequenced. And because of that, we can manipulate their genomes. We can manipulate their metabolisms to work for us, to benefit us. So one of, I have some examples here of ways that E. coli and yeast have been genetically modified to produce medicine for different groups, such as 
insulin for diabetics. And as we learn more and more about microbial genomes, there's going to be more ways that we can use them to impact our biomedical and biotech systems. So this is my final portion of the talk, and this one is going to take a little bit longer because um, it is what I am the most of an expert in. This is what I did my PhD in. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of my PhD and hopefully prove or show you the ways that microbes are affecting botany and agriculture and what this means for our food system. So I, I like to say that now we sort of live in a pesticide planet and we need to. We have to, just like antibiotics. Um, they can have consequences, but not using them has drastic, drastically worse concentrates consequences. So right now, with all the pesticides that we're using and all the methods that we're using to keep our plants alive, we are still losing 20 to 30 percent of our crops due to pests and diseases. But these do have some negative side effects. As we're increasing our use of pesticides or in fertilizers even, we are decreasing our biodiversity in the soils and in the microbiome of the plants. We are also increasing our greenhouse gases, which is having impacts on climate change. Pesticides can impact the water system if they get in there, and it's estimated that they cause at least $2 billion in water contamination every year. Not to mention they also cause a number of medical issues. It's estimated that $15 billion of medical issues are caused because of pesticides. And I actually think that number is quite a bit higher. When you think of in, less, in, in other countries, they may not have the proper equipment to, to spray on these pesticides. And then my final negative against uh, pesticides is that most of it is off target. Where spray, a lot of pesticides are in spray form which can be very fast, and when you spray a lot of it, can be effective. But a lot is off target. A lot gets dispersed into the air, gets into the water, um, can, can produce pesticide toxins to the sprayer who's using it if they do not have the proper medical equipment on. And then finally, just like we see with antibiotics, we are seeing a rise in resistance. Our pests, our insects, our pathogens are able to resist against this pesticide, making them less useful. So by 2050, again, it's always 2050, but by 2050, they estimate the world population is going to be 9 billion, maybe even 10 billion by that point. And we have to double our output in agriculture in the next 30 years in order to sustain that population. And that's sustaining it at the level now, which we still have so much poverty and so much loss due to malnutrition. So we need to come up with some new alternative methods. And while there are a lot of great methods out there, I'm going to talk specifically about some microbial potential, potential microbial products that we can use. So before we jump into that, we have to talk a little bit about the disease triangle. So this is something that is often taught in plant pathology, that you need to have these three elements in order to have disease. You need to have a susceptible host. You need to have a virulent pathogen, meaning that the pathogen or microbe has to be pathogenic to the host. Not all microbes, and the one we're going to talk about today, is pathogenic to every single plant. It's going to have, it's going to be, have a different relationship with the different kinds of plants that we have. And then you need to have a favorable environment. So if the environment needs, and it needs to be favorable to weakening the host or, and or promoting the pathogen. So what are some ways that we can take away, if you take away any one of these triangles, you can prevent disease. So what are some ways that we can do that? Well, first, to stop a virulent pathogen, we can spray pesticides, as we mentioned, but we can also create biocontrols. We can create microbes which are antagonistic or fight um, against another microbe. For a favorable environment, we can take advantage of irrigation or geography. Um, the particular microbe I'm going to talk about today is an issue in California 
wine industry. It is not quite the same issue in the, Fran in the French wine industry. And that's because of the environment, it's because of the host, and it's because of the pathogen. The pathogen is not found so much over there. And then finally, how can we manipulate the host to be more resistant against a pathogen? This can be something like cultural practice as harvesting and pruning. So a lot of plants get pruned and that pruning creates a wound. It creates an opening. And this creates an entry point for a lot of pathogens. So can we leverage our knowledge of pathogens or the environment to prune or harvest at certain times of the day or certain times of the season? that have a less popul population of the pathogen, which means there's less disease pressure in that particular instance. And the other way that we can look at this is leveraging pedigrees. So can we, and this can be done organically, like knowing that a certain variety of grapevine is less susceptible or has a better relationship with the pathogen than another variety. Or it could be genetically modifying the plant to produce some sort of antimicrobial or some sort of gene that is going to make it resistant to the pathogen. But before you do any of that, you really have to understand the whole ecosystem and how everything is relating to each other. So sustainable agriculture then is a very ecosystem-based strategy. It can include things like biologic controls, microbes fighting other microbes. It can include things like habitat manipulation, knowing where the microbes or where the pathogenic microbes are at highest population and avoiding those locations. We can develop resistant varieties either through pedigree, leveraging pedigrees and, cross, um, and crossing certain strains, or we can do it through genetically modifying the organism. We can also modify our cultural practices and as an example of this, for instance, is monoculture is really big right now, and that destroys the soil, and it depletes the biodiversity, and it increases pathogen populations for that particular crop that you're growing. But if you rotate it every year with a different plant, now it's going to cultivate a different microbiome. It's going to suppress the other pathogens that were pathogenic to the first crop, and perhaps shift the amount of disease pressure in the field. So that's an example of modifying our cultural practices to diminish pathogen populations. And then finally, we can create what's called biofertilizers. So these are fertilizers that are made of microbes or of things that microbes like to eat that you can place on the um, soil of your field. And this will help create more resilient plants or diminish pathogen populations or create more nutrients for the plant to grow. It can be a number of different things. And this research is really at its infancy, which I think is really exciting because there's so many different ways that we can move forward right now. And so this brings us to our case study. So this is Zyella fastidiosa. This is the Causal agent of Pierce's disease of grapevine. It is vectored by insects. It causes $104 million a year in losses. It has symptoms such as leaf scorching, berry dehydration, and can eventually lead to death. And there's currently no cure. Management strategies right now are basically spreading pesticides to diminish the insect population. And Xyla fastidiosa is a particular problem for grapevines in California. Now, grapevines have um, the major product of which that we consume is wine, have been, have been domesticated 6,000 years ago. And currently, we have over 10,000 different varieties of grapevines. We have, um, they have inspired cuisines, medicines, cults, economies. Grapevines have played a major role in the history of humans in our society today. They are a clonal woody perennial crop, meaning that when you put them in, the, in a field, generally they all have the same genetic material. They are there year after year after year. So once it has the disease, it can take, um, it, and you have to remove it and plant a new one, it can be a very costly process. In California, 
Grapevine's account for it, it's a $6.25 billion industry. So it has a huge economic value to California, it has a huge economic value to France, Argentina, uh, Australia, a number of different countries across the world. And it's estimated that without pesticides, we would lose 97% of the grapevine wine production. 97%. So we need pesticides right now in order to maintain our desire for grapevines. So this is what disease severity, a Pierce's disease, can look like. On the left, you can see we have a very healthy vine with big canopies. It's very green. Um, then we can get moderately symptomatic. And you can see the leaves are a little bit more yellow. We have a little bit of scorching on the side. You can see there's a little orange uh, bursting out there. And the actually the width and, and the health of the trunk here doesn't look quite as healthy. And eventually this can progress into severely symptomatic vines. So this is the case here in our C diagram. You can see the canopy is much lower. The shoots are very short. Uh, and I mean, you just look at this plant and you know that it's pretty sick. So the overall hypothesis that drove my PhD is that if Vitis vinifera, which is the scientific name for grapevine in a vineyard is clonal. They all have the same genetic material and the same environment, and they're under the same disease pressure. But in a vineyard, we can see side by side, one vine severely sick with Pierce's disease, another vine completely fine. I mean, could we, can we relate this disease severity to the microbiome? Is there some microbial players there that are either helping Xyella to cause the disease or diminishing its population so that the vine can be healthy. And so that is what drove my PhD. So I'll go in a little bit of what we found, and this is a very bird's eye view of the whole, the last five years of my life, I guess, six years of my life. Um, so this is the overview. At heart, I am a bioinformatician. Um, I love playing with data. I love creating graphs and data visualization. So the bulk of my PhD was to understand the different microbial communities within the grapevine. And this occurs by um, taking some sample collection, processing the samples, extracting the DNA, and then sequencing it. And then you create a really big table. And this table has as its columns, you have each of the samples that you created. And as your rows, you have each unique microbe. And then the data points are the counts or the number of each microbe correlated to each sample. And then you have to make sense of that. And you use that a lot of databases, you lose a lot of programs in order to get to your data visualization to try to draw some sort of correlation between the microbes and the biology that you see in the field. And so one thing that came out of this, so I, I looked at six different biocompartments or six different places within the grapevine. So we looked at the soil, which is not connected to the plant at all. We looked at the rhizosphere, which is kind of the dirt that covers the roots. We looked at the roots, particularly the interior of the roots. And then we looked at the cordon and the cane, which would be the very woody tissue of the grapevine. And then finally, I looked at the sap. So the sap is kind of the liquid um, water transport, the phloem, the xylem. Um, so kind of this nutrient water transport system of the vine. And so each one of these niches, each one of these bio compartments have a different environment. They have different nutrients. They have different space. And so it's going to collect a different assortment of microbes. And so one thing that I thought was sort of interesting is in our healthy vines, we had a greater proportion of glomermycota. Now, glomermycota is a phyla in the fungi kingdom, which is known to have a lot of mycorrhizae fungi, which are known to benefit the plants and make them stronger and healthier over time. So that was one thing that kind of came out of this is maybe some plants have a stronger relationship with beneficial microbes, such as glomermycota, and maybe that helps them to be more resilient against a pathogen. Another thing that we saw is we could start drawing negative correlations to our pathogen population and our microbes that we found. And we came up with Pseudomonas and a Chromobacter 
being negatively correlated to the pathogen. Now, this is great, but it's only found bioinformatically. We have to put it back into the field or back into the biology to see if it actually works. But what this did do, what the bioinformatics did do, is take thousands of different microbes and narrow it down to just two microbes to look into. So what we did is we found some, uh, we, we cultured some microbes from the grapevine, particularly looking for these two species, or two gen genuses, I should say, Pseudomonas and Acromobacter. And we found some that were native to the microbes. And so the first thing that we did was challenge them uh, or put Xyla fastidiosa and our potential biocontrol in a plate and see if there's any inhibition. And this is very similar to the way that antibiotics were found with Alexander Fleming's story is you're seeing how these microbes compete with each other in a petri dish. And we ended up testing four different microbes against this. So we have Pseudomonas fluorescence, represented here by PF in the orange bar, and Pseudomonas putida, represented here in the purple bar. So these two have the highest bars, meaning that they inhibited the growth of Xyla the most. So looking at this graph, this was our thought that these were going to be the best candidate biocontrols. We also have a Chromobacter in Pseudomonas verdiflava that we also tested. These did not inhibit the growth of Xyla. So we we're like, these are probably not going to work when we put them in the plants, but let's try it anyways. And so we wanted to go from the bioinformatics. So we went from the field and got all of our microbes. We went to the bioinformatics to pull out just one or two that we thought was purposeful. And then we went to the lab to test them head on in a Petri dish. But we could take this a step further. We can go into the greenhouse. We can introduce the host back into the system. And so what we did is we've developed this Pierce's disease scaling, visual scaling system where we can see the differences in Pierce's disease severity in plants, uh, in single vine plants grown in the greenhouse, which has a little bit more control than out in the field. So this scaling system goes from zero to five, where zero is a healthy plant and five is a dead and dying plant. And so we could dual inoculate these microbes into these plants. And the way we do this is we take these cuttings of grapevines, we grow them, and then you can take a little droplet of your pathogen and your biocontrol, which they're little liquid clear droplets, but in there, there are hundreds and thousands of little microbial cells. And you place it on the stem of the vine. And then you use a needle to puncture the plant tissue. And the negative pressure within the xylem will suck up that liquid into the vine. And then you can see if, if there's a difference. Does the biocontrol impact the symptoms of Pierce's disease? Does it diminish the population of Xyla fastidiosa? And so we could look at the visual symptoms pretty clearly at the end of the season. And what we found was really surprising. We actually found that a Chromobacter and Pseudomonas verdiflava, which were the ones that had the very low bars in our in vitro, in our plate assay, actually had the lowest disease severity in our vines, meaning that a Chromobacter and Pseudomonas verdiflava seem to be better biocontrol agents in the greenhouse than Pseudomonas fluorescens and Pseudomonas putida. And so this is something that we are still diving into and, and trying to understand because we had a flip-flop. We had a complete 180 from what we had in the lab. And so we have a number of experiments this summer that I'm really excited about to see where it goes and whether or not we can get to a mechanism of why this might be happening in the plant and why we saw what we did in the lab. And so uh, just to toot my own horn here, I guess, on what my PhD did, it was the first comprehensive culture-independent microbial study that included SAP wood, disease, season, year, and biocompartments all playing crucial roles in microbial assemblage and disease severity. We looked at how Pseudomonas fluorescens and putida had inhibitory qualities against Xyla fastidiosa, but did not protect them in the greenhouse assay. However, we did so that Pseudomonas verdiflava and Acromobacter xyloxidans 
detected had protective qualities against Xylella fastidiosa in planta, but not in the lab. And so as a sort of summary, when we're thinking about plant microbiomes, there's a number of ways that we can use them and leverage them for disease management strategies. So as I mentioned earlier, microbes can be biocontrol agents, and they may do so in a number of different ways. For instance, we, we believe based on some preliminary analysis that or a current hypothesis right now on mechanisms is that Pseudomonas verdiflava might be enhancing the biofilm of Xyla fastidiosa. And when Xyla fastidiosa's biofilm is triggered, it will no longer colonize the whole vine. And maybe that allows the vine to clear the infection or to not overreact to the, the, the population of Xyla that's inside it. And so maybe this is a way that Pseudomonas verdiflava is working in the plant but didn't work in the lab. We also talked about Acromobacter xyloxidans. So we know that Acromobacter xyloxidans has an enzyme called ACC deaminase. And so this enzyme can help create ethylene or lower ethylene, which is a stress hormone in plants. And so is Acromobacter xyloxidans priming the plant? And we're going to try to figure this out through um, some transcripto transcriptomics work over the summer. Because of what it's doing, if it's priming the plant, it's sort of um, nudging the plant like, hey, you know what? A pathogen may come. You better get ready. And if it can get ready in time before the pathogen occurs, well, now it can clear the infection before Pseudomonas or before Zayla fastidiosa can colonize the whole plant. And then we talked about the potential of glomeromycota creating this more healthy, resilient plant by having this symbiotic relationship with the roots. So it's providing protection. We can also look, we also need to look at all the different factors that might be impacting the microbiome as a whole. So this really is a very ecosystem-based process to get to a more sustainable solution. So that is the um, end of my talk. Just to wrap up, I believe that microbes have a limitless potential to make every aspect of our lives better. Now, we've talked about top ways microbes affect you, particularly in uh, making food, such as beer and bread. We talked about how microbes can help us synthesize vitamins, such as vitamin B. And we talked about fecal transplants as a means to defend our bodies when we fall ill. We talked about ways that microbes can affect the environment, from CO2 mitigation with Prochlorococcus as our photosynthetic microbe, to methane digesters and the creation of biogas and fertilizers to put back into the land. And then we talked about microbes and how they impact our weather, such as petrichor and our story of streptomyces in the rain, and then snow with our protein INAZ and our microbe Pseudomonas syringae. We talked about how microbes affect medicine and the story behind penicillin and how we need to transition away from antibiotics and into a more, something more targeted against a, a particular pathogen. And one way may be phage therapy. And then we talked about the use of microbes and how they affect, we can use them for cell factories to create medicine for chronic diseases such as diabetes. And then we dived into a little bit about microbes affecting botany and agriculture and how microbes may be able to control pathogens, such as what we talked about with P. verdiflava changing the behavior of Xyla fastidiosa. We also talked about how a chromobacter or other microbes may help enhance the immune system of the grapevine. And then finally, the symbiotic relationship between glomeromycota and the roots. So with that, i just like to thank you all for being here, and I'd like to thank BioCord for hosting me, and I hope that everyone now has a little bit more appreciation for the microbial world, or a better understanding of how microbes affect us every day. I'd also like to thank Jonathan Mitchell, and my mom, Julie Grubar, and our artist, Celia Shee, so a lot of the cartoony pictures you saw 
in today's talk was from Celia. And then finally, I just want to shout out Microbytes. So they will be giving a talk next week, same time, same place, I believe. Um, so Microbytes and I work together on various projects, and I love them. They're really great. They do, they take articles, scientific articles, and put them into bite-sized material. So only about six or seven paragraphs, short paragraphs at that too. They put all these little cute cartoons and everything. And they even are translating all these articles into, I don't know, four or five different languages now. So it's just an incredible initiative. And so if you like today's talk, or even if you didn't like today's talk, but you like microbes, maybe that talk will be more suited for you. And I highly encourage everyone to check that one out as well. And with that, I will say thank you so much. And I'll take questions or I'd love to talk to anyone about microbes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tess. Uh, such a great talk. And yeah, I definitely had a microbe moment during that. Um, <laughs> it's such a, so true what you talked about that, you know, the sort of bad guys of the microbe world get all the, get all the attention, but there's so many good guys out there. Anyway, so I'll just do a little small plug before I get to the questions. I've been writing them down, so I have them to ask you. Um, just to remind everyone that our summer conference is happening from July the 23rd to July the 25th, 2021. We have a Nobel laureate speaking, and if you would like to sign up for an internal talk, if you'd like to give a talk at the summer conference, do get in contact with us. Anyway, let's get going with the questions. Of course, the first question was about the fecal transplants, or the, the transfusions, as I like to call them. But this question was, how much of the fecal matter actually needs to be transplanted in order for it to work? That's a, that's a really good question, and I'm not sure. I know that in the past, it's been like the full fecal, but I think they have moved into, I don't know if they're officially like doing just pills yet, um, but I know in the past it was the full fecal sample. I'm not entirely sure where it is now. That's a good question. Interesting. Okay, so the next question is, hopefully I'm going to say these Latin names right. What is the connection between streptomyces and streptomycin? Is streptomycin de derived from streptomyces? streptomyces? Yeah. yeah, so streptomycin was the second antibiotic that was discovered. And that is also a very interesting story because um, there was a female scientist who was on that team and she was told that because she's going to get married and change her last name, that she doesn't have to be on the patent. Um, and so she lost rights to, to that discovery, which I think is incredible injustice to, to females everywhere. Um, but yeah, so streptomycin is derived from streptomyces. Hi, sorry, is that working now? My Discord froze. <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I don't know wh at what point I cut through, but I'll just repeat the question. So the question I had was, with the snow bacteria, um, I can't remember the species name, but um, wouldn't the cold temperature be detrimental to that pathogen? Yeah, so, so microbes can form um, endo endospores. So they're sort of like protective qualities, right? It's protective shield around them that they can then survive in these colder temperatures. So I th I'm not entirely sure the case with Pseudomonas syringae and INAZ, but it does, it does form sort of a protective um, coat around itself so it can survive in these colder temperatures. And they've actually, so a lot of the artificial snow that we have, they're using the protein INAZ in order to create that artificial snow that we see on uh, ski slopes. Oh, so cool. Oh, I'm definitely having a second micro moment. <laughs> so another question. What role does climate change play in plant pathology populations? Is it true that a plant passport has been created to avoid epidemics in other countries? Yes, yeah, so that I mean, that's another really excellent question. And one that is really hard to answer, because it, it's when by the time that we see climate change shifting, how much has it shifted in the microbial world? 
and they are seeing different pathogens as we have hotter temperatures or areas are full of hotter temperatures. We're, we're seeing on a macro scale even that certain populations are moving further north. So this is going to impact plant pathology, but I don't think we've we're at a point of fully appreciating how drastically this this could shift plant pathology as a whole. Right, right, of course. Okay, that's all that in my word doc. Um, so next question. Is it possible to develop fertilizers that only provide the required nutrients for the plants that you want to grow? Yeah, so that that is uh, the million dollar question. Um, so there's a lot of research right now going into biofertilizers and how can you make the optimal biofertilizer for your particular crop. And we're not there yet. I do think it's possible, um, but I think we have a ways to go in understanding the role of microbiomes and the host and the environment before we can get to the point of creating this optimal biofertilizer. Cool, yeah. So the next question is, what do you think about the recent success of using a bacterium in mosquitoes to limit the spread of dengue fever? Now, I actually did a presentation of this in undergrad, so I know it's Wolbachia is the bacterium. Yeah, yeah. So Wolbachia and mosquitoes, I think it's, it's really amazing that they're able to understand the biology and the system of that to that point. I think it's, um, it's a fabulous initiative. I know it's it's been tried and it seems to be working right now, whether or not we're going to see impacts and shifts in the ecosystem later on, we'll sort of see. But uh, I mean, I think it's a really great way of sort of manipulating biology for our own benefits. And I know there's something else, there's another thing with Hawaii and some of their endangered birds out there, they're getting infected with mosquitoes or they're getting infected with diseases that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And they're trying to use the same thing to help those endangered species to survive. So I think it's, it's a really great way to sort of under, use biology to our advantage. Yeah, I definitely agree. When, when I first heard about the Wolbachia and as well as um, like the phase therapy, I just thought, you know, that's so cool. It's such a cool use of biology, you know, to get around a, a traditional view and sort of create a new way of solving our problems that we have. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, so do clonal grapevines have the same epigenetic changes to each other? Basically, my question is, what other factors other than just a microbiome did you control for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a great question that I also don't have an answer to now. Um, but yeah, like there are so many factors that could be um, impacting this disease severity. So I chose to focus on the microbiome. So there are other people focus on the epigenetic differences between the the vines that we see there's also the the aspect of you can have a rootstock so often in a vineyard you have a rootstock and that rootstock you graft on the vine and so now you have kind of these two different genetic codes and how do those sort of communicate with each other that may be impacting disease severity as well um so yeah i think there's there's a lot that can be done in plant pathology in all realms of molecular biology to understand these systems. But they can be really hard to connect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's always, <laughs> that's the thing with biology. It's, I, I like to call it the science of exceptions. And it's because there's just so many variables that you can just add on and add on and different areas and different things don't work in certain conditions. So <laughs> at, at yeah. some point you just have to pick, you have to pick something and study that one. Um, okay. So we're getting into some questions, I think about your PhD work, which was just fabulous. Um, so this one, so yeah, I'm not sure which slides you're referring to. This one was, could you give a practical example of why it was useful to create a network of pathogens? I'm not sure I understand the question on that one. Uh, let me try and find who asked it. Um, I think you had a slide that had all of these networks of them. Maybe they're asking to do with the, the whole microbiota of the soil and things. Um, as in, why is it useful to know the networks as opposed to just knowing you know, the single species. Are, are we referring to this slide? Um, no, they have not responded again. <laughs> oh, before, before this slide, they've said, maybe the one before. Um, I'm not sure. Do you want to rewrite what 
what you meant and I can ask the next question in the meantime. Um, so the next question was to do with bioinformatics. So did you find that the bioinformatics study, did it really mimic the real world scenario or what, was it different? What was the differences between the two? So, yeah, that's an excellent question. I think bioinformatics is a really fun and interesting tool, but at the end of the day, all you have is sequences. And when you're doing Amplicon sequencing, as I did in this study, you are introducing a lot of biases. And so you get kind of away from the what actually is in the field because you have PCR biases, you have DNA extraction biases, um, and you have sequencing biases. And so you end up getting further away from the bio biology, but that's why it's so important to then put it back into a biological system to see, okay, this is what I found in the bioinformatics. Can we draw, can we extend this back into the biology and come up with the same conclusions, or the same correlations? And so, yes, I believe that whatever we got with the bioinformatics is different than what is actually in the field, particularly when you're looking at proportions of certain microbes. But we were able to pull out two microbes that appear to be negatively correlated to our pathogen through bioinformatics and show that there was some sort of biological significance to that. And then the other thing I'll just say is when you're dealing with microbes, you can have such a big strain difference or species difference at that. So like when we were talking, I had three different pseudomonas strains. So with the bioinformatics, we only really pulled out pseudomonas at the genus level. We don't get to the strain level. We don't get to the species level. We just have this genus level. And pseudomonas is one of those, um, is a genus that has hundreds of different microbes that are actually correlated or in that certain genus. And so we pulled out three of them. One of them worked and two of them did not work. So I think that's an example of sort of just how the bioinformatics can help you narrow your focus in the biology. But because of strain differences and species differences, it, it's not always going to work. And so it can be a tool. It's not the only solution. I like that view. I like that view that it's, it's a tool, you know, as opposed, you know, to help us get closer to obviously some real world applications, but it's not, you know, the sort of ground truth, if you like, but it's still, you know, an instrument to use and, and to help us to learn more about our world as is any technique. Um, okay, so the next question, uh, so these are all to do with your work. Um, so how did you quantify growth and inhibition of growth in your studies? With the inhibition, um, what we ended up doing is we looked for a halo. So basically when you have a plate, a Petri plate, you can see a cloudiness of where the microbes grow. And so what we did is we took a plate and we grew both of them together and looked, do we see a zone of inhibition? So in the case of Pseudomonas fluorescence, we had zero xylella growth. It was complete, xylella was not, it was put on the plate, it did not grow at all. And in the case of um, P. putita, what you will see is a little cloud of Pseudomonas putita and then a halo and then a little bit of xylella growth. So you can kind of look at this clearing or this zone or halo, as it's often called, to see um, whether or not they're competing against each other. And that can kind of tell you how, if they're antagonistic to each other. So when we did whole genome sequencing on Pseudomonas fluorescence and Pseudomonas putita, we did find that they create an antimicrobial. And so it's thought that they produce this antimicrobial in the plate. And then that created that zone of inhibition or inhibited the growth of our pathogen Zyella. Interesting. Very cool. Okay, so we've got last two questions. Um, this one is, so the, the discrepancy between growth and greenhouse performance could suggest either that the mechanism does not inhibit growth itself, but some interaction of causing disease. So the plant is needed. Uh, however, it could also indicate that the microbiome is not the driver behind these differences. How did you rule out these hypotheses? So it, it's something that we're still trying to rule out currently. So we have a number of experiments right now that we will conduct over the summer to try to understand a little bit more of the mechanism behind this. Um, so yeah, it could not be microbial um, driven at all, which would be very sad for me. 
but it is a possibility. And as a scientist, it's something that you always have to remember that it just may not work no matter what you're seeing or your hypothesis is. But I think if we can understand a little bit more about the behavior of Pseudomonas ferritiflava or Chromobacter inside the vine. So we're going to try to do some RNA-seq experiments over the summer that might help us understand if a Chromobacter is priming the plant. Um, then we can sort of understand a little bit more about how these microbes may be changing the behavior of the plant or changing the behavior of the pathogen. So it's a really, really good question. Uh, and it's something that's always in the back of my mind. I really hope it's microbial, but I also know that it could be something totally different. Um, and hopefully the experiments we do over the summer will help elucidate that a little bit. Definitely, and you're right in the, you know, that's just how science works, right? And uh, something an old mentor of mine once told me has really stuck with me is that there's no such thing as negative results. You know, either way you learn something, even if you find out that's not how it works. You know, ultimately, we just want to learn more about the world we're in. And sometimes you do that by taking a step backwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in a PhD, like 80% of your results are negative results. So you have to learn right. to love them. They're just accidental controls, right? Yeah. <laughs> So the final question is, I'm not sure of the context of this one, but Kraken asked it right at the end, is how, what does an overreaction look like? Um, I think that was in reference to one of the last slides. Overreaction. Oh, so an overreaction, yeah, I'm not entirely sure I understand this question either. But it, it does, there is a lot um, that has to do with the population, right? So if you have too much of any one microbe, it could turn pathogenic. And that could be, oh, I know what you're talking about. The overreaction of the plant, I think, is what they're referring to. So one of the ways that the plant is, one of the ways that the plant um, tries to control xylella is this production of tyloses. So tyloses are these balloon-like structures that kind of come out of plant cells. And their idea is to create this barrier. And this barrier um, is supposed to block xylella, but it also blocks water. Now, if you remember, a lot of the um, symptoms of Pierce's disease is water, is very similar to water stress. And so one of the reasons that we might see a severity, disease severity in grapevine is because they're producing all these tyloses and it's blocking too much of their water system. And then they're creating too much stress in their own environment. They're creating this own toxic environment to control the pathogen, but in turn killing themselves as well. And we did some experiments, which I didn't talk about too much today, where we looked at the differences in, we looked at five different varieties or cultivars of grapevine to understand why their disease severity is different with Xyella. And the one that had the biggest, the most severe reaction had um, the biggest tyloses, had the biggest xylem vessels. And so we can understand that the anatomy of different cultivars is, is, being play, is playing a role in the disease severity over time. I think that was what that question was referring to. Yes, Kraken did respond and said, yes, that was correct. Uh, she yeah, also said, it sounds like inflammation, plant style. <laughs> okay, I think so. There are no further questions I can, that I've got saved, unless anyone's got any last minute ones to add in the channel. I'm sure all of us want to give a huge thank you to Tess for coming along and doing the talk for us. It was amazing and so, so grateful for you to come and chat about your work as well. Super interesting. We have lots of PhD students here who I'm sure are really interested to see that it can be completed. It can, it can be finished. <laughs> you can get things done <laughs> and get that, you know, coveted doctor title. Anyway, so thank you so, so much for coming to talk. Um, I'm sure people sticking around after the lecture in the lectures on conference channel if you wanted to chat to anyone but without anything else thank you and see you all another time yeah thank you everybody bye <laughs>